Like if your entire net worth was tied to those seed phrases, what do you do? Well, you can't just put them on a bit of paper. What if your house burns down? Well, what right. if it's just in your house and someone robs you? Like basically you get to the point of splitting up into three different places and putting it like underneath a volcano in three different continents to be right. really safe. Let's talk about first a little bit about what's going on in that whole space for those who don't really understand it. And then, um, you know, with the DeFi platforms, right? How are like, how are you solving those problems? And so that that doesn't happen again, right? Because people are losing yep. a lot of money. So it's a really good question. And it's a really complex situation with sure. what happened with something like FTX. So on, on a simple layer, they were using customer funds um, to fund ac other activities in highly leveraged positions um, and sometimes very opaque um, conditions to put that politely. And so as a result, when some of those highly leveraged positions didn't work out, they weren't backed one to one with asset uh, customer funds. So when customers then realized that there was a problem, you had exactly the same scenario you do with the bank run is people were starting to try and withdraw their assets. There weren't that many assets there. Suddenly they can't fulfill withdrawals. Now, I find it really interesting in many ways that people go, well, FTX is an example of why crypto doesn't work. Um, because as you say, centralized exchanges are kind of the antithesis to um, what crypto is meant to be about. A centralized entity controlling all of your funds is basically what the traditional <laughs> finance system is. And having some black box doing thing, God knows what, with your funds, with your assets at any point, getting into stupidly over leveraged positions with no transparency or oversight, has caused financial crises far outside of uh, crypto on sure. many previous occasions. Now, having said that, I think centralized exchanges currently serve a, a massive benefit to the crypto industry mm -hmm. on the whole. Um, and I, they're, they're serving a need in the market. Like, let's be really pragmatic about this. Currently, the user experience for utilizing Web3, crypto, and whatever else isn't good for most people. It's highly yeah. complex. Self-custodying your own funds at minimum is terrifying and is at maximum something no one really wants to do. Like securing your, your crypto assets, you need like a, a hardware wallet, which again, isn't expensive, but they're a bit clunky for the security. You've got seed phrases, which are 28 random words that you've yeah. basically are the keys to all of your assets, keep them safe. And like, you have to go to the level of like, if your entire net worth was tied to those seed phrases, what do you do? Well, you can't just put them on a bit of paper. What if your house burns down? Well, what right. if it's just in your house and someone robs you? Like, basically, you get to the point of splitting up into three different places and putting it like underneath a volcano in three different continents to be right. really safe. But then that's completely impractical to go and access your funds. So there's this balance of like user experience. Um, and so centralized exp exchanges fill that need. They're like, hey, we'll look after your assets and you can buy and sell them easily through us. And so it was user convenience. And I, I don't fault them for that. They're serving a market need. As an industry, and one of the things we're doing at Radix is really looking at all of these pain points. Why, why is Web3 and, and crypto, whatever you want to call it, why is it not solving the user need that the vision presents? Because I think it's not really a hard sell, the vision of crypto. Like, hey, your money, you look after it, you control it, you decide where it goes. Sure. No other people should be able to tell you what you do with your money, where it belongs, and when you can access it and where you can send it. It's not a hard sell. When you go to the practicality of that, like people watching this, like very intelligent people, financially savvy, sure, they're probably up for that challenge. Our, our friends, our families, our colleagues, uh, our mums, our grandparents, whatever, are they going to do that? Probably not. I mean, my my nan, love her dearly, um, she thinks the internet is Facebook. Um, and so she's not going to sit there and be like, well, I'm going to go and do this. And then that's just holding funds. When you then go and look at interacting with DeFi and Web3 today, still, it's not a great user experience because if you've ever used something like MetaMask, which is the most mm -hmm. common wallet you use with things like Ethereum, if you go onto something like Uniswap, which is a decentralized exchange, for a start, what most people don't realize is it says, oh, approve Uniswap smart contract. So that's mm -hmm. like the decentralized application to control your USDC, as an example. And you say, okay. What most people don't realize is that's usually a blanket authorization for that decentralized application to do anything with your balance of USDC. Because it's not actually in your wallet, it's in another smart contract, but that's sure. getting a bit technical. Secondly, when you then say, hey, I want to swap my USDC for Ethereum or Radix or whatever, and you click go on the, the web interface, currently the wallet pops up and it says, hey, you're doing this swap. That swap, or it doesn't even say that swap, it says you're doing this transaction. 
which is presented as a hash. Um, so for most people, random string of letters and numbers. Then tells you it's going to cost this much of a fee, approve or deny. And that's the only info you get. So you basically have to completely trust whatever the web UI said is what's going to happen. Because when you hit approve, we're, it's what we call in the industry, you're blind signing. You're signing that and hoping for the best. You have no way to verify if it's true or not. That, again, is just one massive area where there's security concerns. Because one, you could have a bad actor. Two, you could have bugs and exploits, which mean that you're, you're approving the wrong thing. Or three, you could just go to the wrong website and approve the wrong transaction without knowing. That's, again, insane. And that, again, isn't the fault of the developers. It's the fault of the entire stack because the sure. developer experience is also really tough because Ethereum and, and Solidity is the most common way to build smart contracts at the moment. And it wasn't designed with the idea of assets in mind. So another thing that blows people's heads quite often is crypto, especially um, Ethereum crypto assets and many tokens are what are called ERC-20 tokens. And so ERC-20 is just the token is made with a smart contract itself. So a smart contract creates them and controls them. And the ERC-20 standard is just a self-imposed standard. Like we need all of these to look roughly the same. So things like wallets and applications can interact with the same kind of standard. The actual Ethereum network and, and every other network apart from Radix doesn't actually understand what a native asset is. It's just defined by a smart contract. That means that a developer has to one, create their own token if they need a token. They have to write these smart contracts to do that. And then they're interacting with potentially thousands of other smart contracts, which all have their own logic and their own way of rebuilding things. In Radix, one of the key differences we make is this concept of native assets. So the, the easiest way I can describe that to people is every layer of the stack from the user interface through to the execution environment and the programming language down to consensus understands what an asset is. So in the network, conceptually, a digital asset behaves exactly the same as a physical object would. So in that example, if I put a physical coin down on a table, it can't fall through the table, it can't disappear. If I hand it to you, while it's in my hand, it's mine. As soon as you take it, it's yours. It doesn't magically become two. It can't. The rules of the universe say that can't duplicate magically. And little things like that make a huge difference to the developer experience. And the way I describe this to people is very similar to game engines. So those of you who don't know, like if you go back to the 90s, video games were really, really hard to make because you had to start by defining what the fundamental laws of the universe were in the game. How does sure. physics work? Gravity, shadows, lighting. And that took about 80% of a developer's time. And it was hard work. And you still, when you went and reinvented the rules of physics every time, ended up with bugs. You fell through the floor, clipped through walls. And in video games, it sucked. It was annoying. And what people realized was actually every game needs these fundamental laws of physics. And so they built game engines. And when they built a game engine, suddenly developers freed up so much of their time to work on novel gameplay because physics were there. And say your game was in space. That doesn't mean that you can't go into the game engine and say set gravity to zero. You could. That's right. the power the engine gave. And that revolutionized the industry. And it games became, a, or video games became an industry that was bigger than music and TV and cinema combined very, very quickly because of the power of an engine. And that is exactly the same as what Radix gives Web3 developers. We give them basically a DeFi engine uh, called the Radix engine to be able to build things. Um, and then you get right to the bottom layer of the stack, which is consensus. Now, this is where when people hear about like high fees on Ethereum or congestion or slow transactions, yeah. mostly that comes from um, scalability. So scalability is like the number of transactions that a, a decentralized platform can, can perform per second. And so if you look at something like Ethereum, that does about 15 transactions per second is where it caps out. Even what's considered the, the best in the world uh, at the moment um, in a live environment is Solana. Solana theoretically does 65,000 transactions per second, which is obviously orders of magnitude higher than Ethereum but still a fraction of what you'd need if you actually moved even a fraction of the $400 trillion global economy running on there. Like Solana and 65,000 transactions per second couldn't even cope with, say, like NASDAQ running on it 24-7. So what Radix did, and Radix started back in 2013, we were looking at how could we solve scalability forever. And the way we did that is with a pretty novel approach to scaling, where we have a massively sharded environment, which... To, to put a number to it, about two to the power of 256 shards. Um, and any of those shards can be combined together 
into a concept we call braiding, where they behave as a single shard while they're braided and then come apart. Now, this concept of sharding and braiding fixes one of the problems that other networks usually have by sharding, which is you then fragment information and there's a delay moving uh, between those different shards and you can't have something called atomic composability, which does a whole bunch of other cool stuff, but uh, check our website if you want to deep dive on that. But like the, the big thing that Radix can do with this technology is when you've got that massive shard space, you're no longer thinking of, oh, we'll put some applications on one shard, some on another. You have so many shards that every single asset, every single fraction of an asset, every single wallet, every single dApp, every single liquidity pool could all have their own shards and you'd still have more than the entire number of atoms on earth remaining. And that means that since you can braid them together as needed, you can massively parallelize what's going on um, when they aren't related asset movements. And if they are related, so if I was sending money to you, for example, our two shards hypothetically could braid together to do that and then split apart again when I go and transact with my mother-in-law or you go and transact with your lawyer. Now, then the only limitation is adding more throughput uh, through nodes. And so this is kind of the other secret source is you can then scale linearly, just like the internet. You just add more nodes, add more servers basically to that system, and more of that shard space can be processed in parallel. And so between that, our, our kind of top line is that full stack is what's really needed to achieve this benefit. You've got to revolutionize the way users interact with the system. You've got to revolutionize the way developers interact with the system so they can build more cool stuff. And then you need to make sure that the infrastructure basically powering that never blocks adoption or creates friction uh, just in the same way as the internet does. Okay, so <clears throat> there's a lot there.